uh, again thanks uh, ajayan sir uh, and our uh, vardhi institute vardhi institute uh, on behalf of vardhi institute i am starting this session today uh, for all my uh, colleagues who are interested in uh, passing the jib examination uh, of this principles and practice of banking uh day before yesterday we discussed uh, the part 1 of this uh, 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 module a and now we will be discussing the part 2 portion of the uh, module a and again it is a very important topics and uh, i hope uh, you will have uh, last time you would have enjoyed and um, uh, you would have been able to understand the main issues relating to the banking and in this also i have tried my best to give you the Uh, latest uh, informations and the detailed informations uh, so friends uh, please listen keenly and again i will request if any of your queries are there i am there to reply at the end but still if anybody has any important query in between you can still ask me so that we can have a clarification uh, and doubts are cleared because this is the purpose of our institute uh, because i uh, as all you know uh the vardhi institute looks after the interests of candidates so friends uh, let us start today we have to go through the role and functions of capital markets uh in this uh, we will be uh, discussing various areas uh, i will have a just overview of this overview of capital market stock exchange commonly used terms types of capital issues financial products instruments including asba uh qip uh, i will discuss sebi registration of stock brokers uh sub brokers share transfer agents etc and qibs again i will discuss it what this qib and qip means mutual funds and insurance companies uh, bank assurance and irda this is the role of functions of capital market will be one portion then we will move to mutual funds uh management and role functions of insurance companies bank assurance irda this uh, under this mutual funds we will discuss under factoring forfeiting services and off balance sheet items we will be discussing types and advantages of factoring and forfeiting services and types of off balance sheet items then we will shift to risk management and basel accords because uh, there is a, uh, this is a part of your syllabus also so in this we will be discussing introduction to risk management basel 1 basel 2 and basel 3 accords although in my notes you will find the detailed uh, basel 1 basel 2 basel 3 but i will try to make you understand in just two or three pages what basically basel 1 2 and 3 says so please listen to the end of this uh, uh, ppts and uh, discuss with me if any of the issue comes to you okay friends you see uh, first of all let us move to role and functions of capital market uh, friends uh, before going to this uh, written material i will uh, just try to explain you uh, that why this capital market has come into existence you see basically uh, any of the entrepreneur who wants to uh, make business uh, the the first and foremost requirement is capital that is money with him so if he goes to any bank or any other area the cost is generally high uh, and uh, the people the businessman wants to get this money from the uh, capital market what this capital market is we will be discussing in the subsequent uh, slides because uh, the capital uh, from the money from the capital market is comparatively uh, very uh, cheap very cheap Uh, in comparison to uh, other financial institutions and uh, banks so friends that is the uh, importance of capital market which has gained these days because the borrower has to look into the margins so if the uh, rate of interest or the uh, cost is at the lower side the businessman uh, will uh, end up with a large profit so this is the importance of capital market now coming to the uh, detailed position which has been written in the uh, slide uh, i will read it for you for any type of business an entrepreneur requires funds oblique capital if the size of the project is very big 
an entrepreneur cannot arrange all the funds oblique capital required by himself the entrepreneur may have to borrow the money from banks financial institutions friends or relatives this may involve heavy cost you see uh, taking from banks and financial uh, institutions involves heavy cost already i discussed with you in the form of interest which affects the profitability further friends as you know borrowing from financial institution also requires collaterals but in case of capital market no collateral is required that's why people are a businessman are moving to capital markets so in order to overcome such issues the promoters may choose to raise a part of their requirement of funds capital from public by offering certain instruments like equity shares debentures bonds and so on and so uh, flow, uh, the capital market floats the instruments in the form of equity shares and also in the form of debentures and also in the form of bonds uh, the definition of bonds debentures uh, have been discussed by me in detail in our last session so if anybody has missed it please go through the last session or if you have still any doubt you can take up with me so in order to raise money from public sebi has prescribed certain rules and regulations for the financial market but you see friends any of the market uh, to be started or to make it uh, function smoothly it is to be controlled by some authority for example we discussed yesterday that reserve bank of india is controlling the financial institutions and the banks in the similar way capital is controlled capital market is controlled by sebi securities and exchange board of india this type of market is called capital market so i think uh, the concept of capital market is now clear to all of you here friends i will uh, make you clear further that capital market is generally of two types one is primary market and another is secondary market so what is primary market again i will discuss with you the primary market is basically when any of the institution goes for initial public offer or follow on public offer or rights shares or bonus shares that is a primary market and the secondary market is the share market where satta baji takes place where bids take place uh, and all of you know that share market uh, we have uh, we make transactions in the uh, uh, direct with the share markets that's called secondary market so this is the difference between primary market and secondary market so uh, any of the shares which are uh, uh, initially issued uh, that are generally primary market and then when there is sale and purchase of these uh, shares thereafter uh, then it becomes a secondary market so this is the difference between uh, primary market and secondary market uh, a different uh, you see now stock exchanges in india for this there are uh, for secondary market there are stock exchanges in india uh at present there are main seven stock exchanges in india so out of this five are main uh bsc limited uh erstwhile bombay stock exchange set up in 1875 bombay stock exchange limited then national stock exchange nse established in 1992 then calcutta stock exchange set up in 1908 but is inactive metropolitan stock exchange of india limited formed in december 2012 over the counter exchange of india limited set up in 1990 so these are the main stock exchanges although there are other so, uh, there are other two also but these are the main stock exchanges uh, with you uh, there is nifty also you see uh, you are you may listening to nifty also for uh, 50 main com companies uh, which is uh, for an exchange is working there also so uh, these are the main five exchanges of stock exchange now uh, what are the main terms which are used in capital market because uh, this capital market is the part of our syllabus uh, and any question can come out uh, in the examination related to the terms used in the capital market so i uh, have tried my um, uh, best to give you the important terms which are used in the capital market so that if any of the question comes to you you are able to reply it the first term mainly is securities transaction what is this security transaction basically any of the transaction which takes place in the security market there is a cost to it there is a tax to it tax is charged for it 
it may range from 0.25% to 1% say so another uh, 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 different uh, rates for different uh, type of securities so security transaction is a tax being levied on all the transactions done on the stock exchange at rate prescribed by the central government from time to time it came into effect from october 1 2004 please note uh, this line the rates are prescribed by central government so it may be a question that who prescribes the rate for securities transaction so you have to reply that rates are prescribed by the central government from time to time second is rolling settlements what does this rolling settlement mean basically basically uh, any of the uh, customer who is going for different settlements uh, on one day he is going for two three settlements and all these settlements are uh, rolled out and uh, in the end uh, the final settlement takes place that's called rolling settlement so in this the trades executed during the day are settled based on the net obligations for the day presently trades pertaining to the rolling settlement are settled on t plus 2 day basis here t stands for trade day so t plus 2 day means uh, that uh, on which we have traded plus 2 days so please note again very important question that if it comes what is the rolling period of rolling settlement what is the period of rolling settlement so you have to reply t plus 2 day basis because sometimes this question is asked for and you should have a re reply that t plus 2 day basis on, on the basis of t plus 2 days this rolling settlements are settled then there is pay in and pay out what is this pay in and pay out basically uh, when uh, the delivery is to stock exchange we call it pay in and when exchange makes payments to uh, deliver uh, or delivery to brokers it's called pay out so when brokers make payments or delivery of security to exchange it is called pay in day that means payments or delivery goes to uh, uh, to exchange then it is pay in day and when exchange makes payments or delivery to brokers it's called pay out day again settlement of cycle is t plus 2 days so please be clear pay in and pay out day because this can be a question then securities lending scheme what is this securities lending scheme basically it is a, a scheme in which uh, the companies which are having their funds idle uh, they can uh, give it to the other uh, companies so that's why it's called securities lending scheme it is a scheme which enables lending of idle securities by the investors to the clearing corporation this clearing corporation is controlling it thus it borrows on behalf of the members securities for the purpose of meeting shortfalls so if there are any shortfalls this clearing corporation takes care of from one institution to another institution so this is securities lending scheme so this four terms are there very important term securities tax transaction rolling settlement pay in and pay out day then securities lending scheme next friends uh, is types of capital issues in primary market you see friends uh, in this primary market uh, we have different types of capital issues one is public issue another is rights issue and another is preferential issue let us know the difference between the three all the three are known as private placements you see there are two type of placement one is private placement and another is uh, uh, public placement we will see how it is uh, happening public issues are further classified into initial public offering ipo and follow on public offerings detailed disclosures are required to be given by issuer company as per disclosure and investor protection guidelines in its offer documents so each and every uh, share which is being uh, floated in the market then uh, the uh, offer documents should contain the details of it now what is ipo ipo is an offering for sale for the first time which makes way for listing and trading of issuer securities what is for fpo fpo is an already listed company may an already listed company makes either a fresh issue of securities to the public or an offer for sale to the public through an offer document 
so ipo is initial public offer first time ipo is initial first time and thereafter if company goes for um, uh, market then it is fpo follow on public issue offer then next is rights issue offer so what is rights issue rights issue is the people who are already the shareholders of a particular company only they can raise the shares that's called rights issue uh, what is the benefit of this rights issue it is done to raise capital without diluting the stake of existing shareholders you see friends in case of rights issue the share is not diluted to the other shareholders uh, but uh, the uh, share remains with the already existing uh, shareholders and their uh, portion increases if they are interested uh, when when the company raises the rights issue so without diluting the stake this is important in case of rights issue that the stake is not diluted in case of rights issue it remains with the already existing shareholders now what is a private placement private placement is an issue of shares or of convertible securities by a company to select group of persons under section 81 of the companies act you see i told you one is public placement and another is private placement in public placement we uh, just discussed ipo and rights issue and fpo but in private placements what happens uh, issue of shares or of convertible securities by a company to select group of persons only select group of persons bigger groups are given the uh, shares for example if uh, any of the bank wants to issue the shares they give a big portion to say lic of india or some other institution that's called select group of persons under 80 section 81 of the companies act 1956 so this is called private placement in case of private placement um, the uh, uh, shares are generally uh, uh, given in bulk to the particular group that's uh, why it's called private placement then two more definitions are coming in this that is qualified institutional buyers and qualified institutional placement qip in the initial stage uh, when i started the session i told you the concept of qib and qip because in your um, uh, syllabus qib and qip has been highlighted so what is this qualified institutional buyer basically qualified institutional buyers are uh, those uh, institutions who are generally possessing the expertise to evaluate and invest in capital market the examples of this uh, qibs are scheduled commercial banks mutual funds foreign institutional investor registered with sebi insurance companies registered with irda and pension funds etc so these are called qualified institutional buyers sometimes the question comes what is what are the qualified institutional buyers so you should bore in mind that who generally possess an expertise to evaluate and invest in capital market they are qualified institutional buyers then they are a qualified institutional placement what is this the qualified institutional placement is a capital raising tool whereby a listed company can issue equity shares and debentures to qib you see any company is raising the any listed company is raising issuing the shares to this qib qualified institutional buyers so qualified institutional placement means that the capital is raised from these qualified institutional buyers qib a capital raising tool where by a listed company can issue equity shares debentures to a qualified institutional buyers this is a speedy method of private placement for companies to raise money it is easy and does not involve many of the common procedural requirements this was also done to prevent the listed companies in india from developing an excessive dependence on foreign capital so that's why uh, our government has started this because uh, uh, the excessive uh, uh, dependence on foreign capital used to take place that's why this qib and qip concept has come into existence so please note this then there is issue pricing of the issue how prices are fixed for the shares there are two ways of fixing the price one way is simple way that is company and lead manager fix a price for any company who wants to raise the uh, shares their lead managers take a market survey and all these things and fix a price this is called fixed price 
the issuer company can mention a price band of 20% that is the price band should not be more than 20% of the floor price floor price is the initial price and they can move uh, up uh, up to 20% of the floor price to be mentioned in the draft offer document and actual price can be determined at later date before file, uh, file filling of the final offer document so in the offer document uh, the rate may be more than uh, 20% but when uh, final offer document is given then the rate is fixed so one uh, where company and lead manager fix the price this is called fixed price then there is another method that's called book building process in this book building process what happens uh, certain bids are called from different uh, institution big institutions and where the higher bid the company gets the higher bid uh, and then the transaction takes place there it is called book building process so one is now uh, fixed price process and another is book building process so far uh, we are concerned like me or you people are concerned if we want to move for purchasing of shares we generally go for the first one that is fixed price but the big institutions go for book building process and under this process the price for securities is assessed based on the bids obtained for the quantum of securities offered for subscription by the issuer so uh, two types of prices again fixed price and uh, book building prices on the basis of bids so this is our portion of uh, this capital market now one more uh, thing is that when we are to purchase the shares the government has started a new concept that's called aspa uh as all of you are bankers and you may be knowing the concept of asba but so far the examination purpose is concerned i will try to clarify what questions are asked uh, particularly uh, related to exams related to asba uh the full form of asba is generally called for what asba means so you should definitely know the full form of asba that is application supported by blocked amount Uh, it's very simple i will read it out for you uh, because it is very simple in order to apply for shares one of the methods that has been explored is asba it is an application containing an authorization to block the application money in the bank account for subscription to an issue so what happens uh, application is called from the uh, customer and the amount in the account is blocked for a certain amount or for which he has applied for the shares and amount is not transferred automatic uh, 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 amount is not transferred at that time the amount is transferred at the time when the shares are allotted to the uh, particular customer so this is a very big benefit in this so application money in the bank account or subscription to an issue is blocked the plus point is that his application money shall be debited from the bank account only if his her application is selected for allotment after the basis of allotment has been finalized so this is the main benefit that's why it's called application supported by blocked amount that means amount is blocked till final allotment of the shares what are the advantages amount is debited only after allotment is confirmed no issues of refund amount remains in the account and earns interest for the period you see since the amount is not debited so we may earn interest till then till actual debit the application form is very simple and no uh, thing of for a refund because uh, when money is debited only for the allotted amount of the shares then no issue of refund comes there so this is the these are the advantages of the aspa so if any question related to this comes you can reply like this Uh, what is sebi securities and exchange board of india uh, just have an idea of it uh, it was started in uh, 1992 april 4 so what are the functions regulating the business in stock exchanges and any other securities market prohibiting fraudulent and unfair trade practices relating to the securities market prohibiting insider trading in securities you know the insider trading i think insider trading sometimes is question asked for what is this insider trading insider trading means any of the person related to the company who has raised the uh, uh, issue issued uh, then any of the person in uh, of the company uh, leaks some information to the public that's called insider trading 
to take the benefit of the pricing so that's called insider trading uh, uh, any uh, person um, takes the uh, wrong uh, benefit of that that's called insider trading it is banned so profit prohibiting insider trading in securities calling for information from undertaking inspection conducting inquiries and audits of stock exchanges and mutual funds calling for information and records from any bank or any other authority in respect of any transaction in securities which is under investigation or inquiry by the board the board shall have same powers as are vested in civil court powers to investigate so these are some of the functions of the board further important thing is that registration of stock brokers sub brokers and share transfer agents is mandatory please note it is mandatory it is mandatory that all stock brokers sub brokers and share transfer agents are registered with sebi in accordance with the regulations made under the act sebi may by order suspend or cancel a certificate of registration in such manner as may be determined by regulations after giving a reasonable opportunity of being heard so uh, registration uh, is very important with the sebi so that uh, any of the person uh, going under this process uh, stock broker or sub broker is taking uh, uh, participating in the uh, share market they should be registered with the sebi now next part is mutual fund friends you see uh, this is also a part of capital fund mutual fund is because uh, shares we purchase individually but in mutual fund what happens as per the word itself it is mutual Meet mutual means uh, collective collective so collective fund uh, that means a fund uh, in the form of a trust so mutual fund means a fund established in the form of a trust which has promoters trustees asset management companies and custodians to raise money through the sale of units to the public or a section of public under one or more schemes for investing in securities money markets gold or gold related instruments real estate assets and such other assets and instruments as may be specified by the board from time to time so basically mutual fund is a trust which collects money from the public and invests that somewhere in the better markets and people get benefit from that uh, you see in mutual fund there is lot of expertise because uh, all the people who are dealing with mutual fund uh, who are uh, and the uh, Uh, staff of the mutual fund companies are all having good training and they invest the money in which they think that the uh, prospective customer or the particular bar, uh, customer will be benefited so there are least chances of loss although uh, the market risk is uh, there also but uh, comparatively the risk is on the lower side so mutual funds uh, are better than individual share taking so in simple terms mutual fund is essentially a common pool of money in which investors put their contribution this collective amount is then invested according to the investment objective of the fund and people are uh, gaining from this you see the money could be invested by the investor in stocks bonds money market instruments yesterday we discussed what this money market instrument is gold real estate and other similar assets these funds are operated by money managers or fund managers who by investing investing in line with the specified investment objective attempt to create growth or appreciation of the amount for investors again you see a mutual fund is required to be registered with sebi which regulates the security market management of mutual funds as per sebi regulations uh, the mutual fund require at least two third of directors of the trustee company or board of trustees must be independent you see the board of trustees must be independent that means they should not be associated with any sponsor who is sponsoring this mutual fund so there should be different directors so that uh, the self interests are taken care also 50% of the directors of the asset management company must be independent so uh, the trustee should not have link with the 
particular sponsor so that they are taking they may take the benefit of it so this thing is also to be taken care of now how performance of this mutual fund is assessed the performance of a particular scheme of mutual fund is denoted by net assets value nav in papers you can also see the nav of particular mutual funds uh, different mutual funds are there so uh, nav for different mutual funds is uh, generally uh, indicated there uh, for example there may be sbi mutual fund pnb mutual fund there may be some insurance mutual fund so this type of mutual funds uh, but the performance of particular mutual fund depends on the net assets value what is this net asset value if question comes what is this net asset value you can give the reply like this the net assets value per unit is the market value of the securities of the scheme that means market value what is floating in the market we have to take the market value of the securities of a scheme less the expenses incurred on the scheme if there are any expenses that, that should be deducted from this uh, total value of securities divided by total number of units of scheme on a particular day uh, uh, upper, uh, on the numerator it is market value it is amount uh, and uh, difference uh, 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 we have to less the expenses but dividing it by the number of units so total amount divided by the number of units uh, we get the net assets value so please be noted further nav is required to be disclosed by the mutual funds on a regular basis uh, or weekly depending upon the type of scheme so this nav is this is mandatory also for the companies uh, uh, mutual fund companies to uh, disclose the nav so that people get the actual position of a particular fund categories of mutual fund sebi has classified mutual funds into following categories there are these are equity schemes which are related to shares then debit schemes that means debit market which is treasury bill uh, yesterday we discussed treasury bill then uh, commercial papers certificate of deposits etc debit schemes then hybrid schemes in which the concept of both are there hybrid schemes solution oriented schemes that means mutual fund may be related to retirement fund or children's fund that's called solution oriented scheme or or other any scheme next important function related to uh, the mutual fund is uh, labeling of products you see friends uh, any company moving for uh, offering the mutual fund uh, moving for mutual fund uh, they should give a, a clear picture of the uh, mutual funds they are investing in uh, by giving the uh, concept of riskometer you see concept of riskometer that means risk should be uh, uh, assessed by the mutual fund and uh, it should be made clear in the document that what risks are there with the mutual fund because people should not be kept in dark and that yes they will earn so much of money this is the uh, will of the public if you, they go for mutual funds <clears throat> after the company gives the risk factor about that so what is this the product labeling of mutual fund is based on the concept of risk meter and this meter depicts the level of risk in mutual funds product labeling helps investors to choose such schemes from within each category so that it matches with one's own risk profile the different levels of risks are low risk moderately low moderate moderately high and high so when any offer document is given they should give the risk uh, by giving whether if you invest in this fund whether the risk will be low whether it will be moderately low it will be moderate or moderately high or high risk so it will be then the discretion of the customer whether he should invest in the mutual fund or not then nature of a scheme such as to create wealth or provide regular income is an indicative time horizon it should also be given in the scheme that whether the scheme uh, is interested in creating wealth or they can get the regular income that is after investing in particular company they get uh, uh, the monthly income from the mutual fund this should be also made clear then a brief about the investment objective what is the objective of the mutual fund company what is their investment objective in a single line should also be uh, given by the 
mutual fund. So this is called labeling of products of mutual fund. So three items are related to labeling of mutual fund. One is riskometer. Second is nature of scheme. And third is brief about the investment objective. So these three are the labeling of mutual funds. Then there is one more concept that is called SIP. Many of you may be dealing with this SIP. SIP is systematic investment, systematic investment plan. An important method to invest in mutual fund. This is just like our bank's recurring deposit scheme. You see, in our banks, we have a recurring deposit scheme, and each month we deposit certain amount in a round figure, and at last we get the fixed amount or with interest. Or in, and in this SIP, we can uh, invest a particular amount uh, monthly or quarterly or yearly, and uh, uh, a huge amount can uh, get collected in the end along with uh, the our principal amount and the uh, amount that has been uh, earned on these uh, mutual funds. So under this scheme, the investors are allowed to invest fixed sum of fixed sum of one's choice either monthly or quarterly for a predetermined period as may be decided. There are some benefits of SIP also and some of them are as under. What are the benefits of SIP? They promote a disciplined approach because a person is committed to invest a fixed amount on a regular basis. A person is free to choose any amount and in most of the schemes can withdraw at his or her convenience. So these are the uh, this is the purpose of systematic investment plan now one thing is more what is the role of mutual fund in capital market uh, it's uh, it is just a theoretical part but i will uh, read for you so that at least you should have a uh, concept role of mutual fund in capital market mutual funds are playing very important role for the investors funds the intermediaries are generally trained in dealing with the investment of funds, all the employees of a registered entity with SEBI and engaged in selling and marketing of mutual fund products have to pass the NISM, National Institute of Securities Market Certification. They have also to obtain registration with AMF. AMF means Association of Mutual Funds in India before canvassing the business of mutual funds. So that's why I just in the outset, I told you that at least mutual funds are better as compared to our individual share markets going for individual purchases because they are having a lot of expertise and training. These days, banks also enroll themselves as corporate distributors and have started marketing mutual fund products. As such, banks also get an additional uh, avenue for earning fee based income. So banks are also uh, moving in mutual funds and thereby uh, earning some commission from it. So this is the uh, overall concept of mutual fund and capital market. I think uh, this uh, part uh, has been discussed in detail now, though you should be able to reply the answers if coming to it. Now, next is role and functions of insurance companies. Second part. Friends, uh, again, uh, nothing is... Uh, uh, hidden from you because you know what is insurance but two or three things should be remembered in insurance one thing is that it is a contract between two parties where one promises the other to indemnify or make good any financial loss suffered by the later in consideration of an amount received by way of premium the customer gives the premium and he is indemnified by the loss if it happens that is the concept of insurance the next is history of insurance. You see, uh, what is written here is basically uh, uh, previously there was uh, insurance company was started in India in 1818 in Kolkata and there was a private sector mostly. But in 1956, most of the insurance sector was nationalized and LIC also came into existence in 1956. Uh, all the private companies, 154 Indian and 16 non Indian insurance companies were merged with this LIC of India. So uh, the, it became a bigger uh, public sector uh, insurance company and other insurance, general insurance companies also came into existence. But again, in 1994, it was felt that 
uh, the uh, government sector of insurance companies is not looking towards the uh, interest of the customers. And again, government decided to uh, give license to the private insurance companies also. So again, in 1994, private sector companies were started. This is the history of uh, the insurance and thereby general insurance companies and health insurance companies came into existence along with the life insurance companies. Because in previous years, before 1994, there was no such uh, concept of health insurance or this uh, other uh, type of insurances. So all these things have come into existence later on. Now, regulatory requirements. You see, regulatory requirements for any of the insurance company is that the life insurance or general insurance business should be at least for uh, for life insurance or general insurance business uh, the minimum capital requirement is rupees 100 crores minimum capital requirement is rupees 100 crores minimum capital requirement for reinsurance business those companies who are going in for reinsurance business they should have a minimum capital requirement of 200 crores please note this may be a question for general insurance it is 100 crores for reinsurance business or exclusive business basis, it is 200 crores. So what is the difference between this uh, normal insurance business or this reinsurance business? You see, reinsurance business basically means uh, that uh, different companies are sharing the risk of a particular big house. You see, there are big business houses and if anything goes wrong with the business, the insurance company uh, will get liquidated insurance company will go to losses that's why two or three insurance companies come together and share the risk of a particular company that's called reinsurance so reinsurance occurs when multiple insurance companies share risk by purchasing insurance policies from other insurers to limit their own total loss in case of disaster described as insurance of insurance that means if one insurance of one company has insured they further insure it with the other companies so this is called reinsurance by the re, uh, reinsurance association uh, this was started by the reinsurance association of america the idea is that no insurance company has too much exposure to a particularly large event or disaster it is just like uh, our banks are having the concept of you know, this uh, that uh, we should not give advance to uh, one business unit uh, that should be a common uh, uh, different bank should come and then they should uh, finance for them so that is uh, that is the concept here also so this is called reinsurance in india reinsurance is done by gic general insurance companies and some foreign companies now, fundamental principles governing insurance contract. This is important because there may be sometimes questions from this. What is the fundamental principle of insurance contract? This is some technical terms used there uh, because all of us know the insurance basically in simple language. But what is this? Uh, what are these technical terms we need to understand? Because questions are maybe asked from these technical terms. One principle is principle of utmost good faith. This utmost good faith means that any person who wants to insure should give the facts of the business or the facts of the life uh, for which he is going to insure himself. So that's called utmost good faith. Company should also give clearly uh, uh, the honest uh, uh, terms and the uh, insurance who takes the insurance, she should also disclose the uh, honest uh, wordings. Uh, what is actually having so but this is actually called uh, principle of ubrimi fidia this is the technical word for this the principle of ubrimi fidia and uh, that is called utmost good faith second is principle of insurable interest insurable interest means that uh, any of the uh, person who is insuring the goods he should have some interest on it for example i cannot insure my friend's house because I have no interest in the house. I am not the owner of the house. I cannot uh, insure the third person's vehicle. So that's called principle of insurable interest. There should be some interest in the particular asset which we are insuring. Then principle of indemnity. Principle of indemnity means indemnifying. 
means any of the loss happening should be indemnified should be given to the particular person for example there is a fire in a company and whatever be with the loss that should be indemnified that should be given to them according to the rules and according to the percentage that's called indemnity but one thing please note this principle of indemnity does not apply to the life insurance accepting life insurance all are indemnity because you see in life insurance there it cannot be indemnified only the amount that has been fixed for death of a person is to be given but in other cases say for example health insurance or say car insurance if there is an accident in a car uh, for say 5 lakhs and uh, there is a loss in the loss to the car by rupees 2 lakh only 2 lakh will be given to the uh, insured person similarly health insurance if there is 10 lakh health insurance and if he uh, gets sick and uh, uh, he has he is hospitalized and wants to an expenditure of 2 lakh that will be indemnified but in case of death uh, of lic uh, life insurance there is no indemnity whatever the amount is there for what it has been insured uh, because on death uh, total amount of the policy is to be given to the customer so please note principle of indemnity applies to all the insurance uh, you know, policies except life insurance mitigation of loss mitigation of loss means that any customer should take the property which is insured uh, he should take care of it that means mitigation of loss uh, it says that if he is having any property he should take proper care of it uh, so that uh, uh, it should not think that my uh, company is insured or my stock is insured and he will take he will not take any interest to safeguard it so he should take every possible uh, thing to mitigate the uh, loss lessen the loss so mitigation of loss is very important risk must attach there must be some risk to it risk must attach if there is no risk then there is no need of insurance there should be some risk for example uh, if there is a stock there may be risk of fire or there may be the risk of stalling the things so if there is some risk then and then only uh, the insurance should take place principle of proximate cause causa proxima very again technical word causa proxima principle of proximate cause that means whatever may be the loss that loss should happen due to the particular immediate cause nearest cause for example a fire takes place in a particular uh, factory and that fire should be a cause of say electricity shock then that is a proximate cause uh, that's that's what uh, it should be nearing to the particular cause and that's why it's called cause of proxima nearing cause nearest cause uh, and it should not be that uh, the owner has himself uh, electrified the stock and uh, then uh, claiming insurance from the company although there may be some legal issues in it so uh, the uh, fundamental principle is it should be principle of proximate cause period of insurance you see period of insurance here is uh, in case of uh, health in, in case of life insurance uh, it is long period say for 10 years or 20 years and thereafter the customer gets the money uh, um, after the policy ends or uh, if any uh, reason due to any reason the death happens to the uh, customer then the amount is paid to the nominee so period of insurance is long in case of uh, life insurance but all other insurance are just for one year please note health insurance is one year general insurance is one year fire insurance is one year theft insurance is one year car insurance is one year so period of insurance is limited in case of other insurance in case of life insurance the period of insurance is for longer period principle of subrogation principle of subrogation means that if loss has happened uh, to a certain insurance company due to the negligence of third party then the insurance company can sue or take action against the third party and claim money from the third party that's called principle of subrogation that means he has a benefit of claiming the money from the person who has actually caused the loss although insurance company will first give the money and then claim it from the person who is actually responsible for the loss of loss to the insurance company so principle of subrogation then there is principle of contribution means if there are two or three companies who have uh, uh, from which the customer has taken the insurance then the insurance part should be contributed uh, it should not be that 
all the companies will give uh, the insurance claim to the uh, beneficiary for example particular customer has taken an insurance from say united insurance and uh, oriental insurance for 10 lakh and 10 lakh and if loss happens for say 5 lakh he cannot claim 5 lakh from oriental insurance and 5 lakh from that so it will come uh, claim it can claim 2.5 lakh from one company and 2.5 lakh from other company. So it's called principle of contribution. So I think I have discussed these principles in detail and its uh, paragraph writing is also given here. You can read out if you have any doubt. I have given very uh, uh, simple uh, language to discuss all this. One point you should note that sometimes a question comes uh, about the insurance that there is an average clause and how much amount the insurance company will give. Uh, you see, average clause is dealt as proportionate approach. The claim amount will be settled for actual loss multiplied by insured amount divided by actual value of goods or property. Please note this formula and I will explain this. What is this? Suppose the actual value of stock is say 15 lakh. Insured amount is 10 lakh. Stock damage due to fire is 8 lakh. Claim will be settled for actual loss. What is the actual loss? Actual loss is 8 lakhs multiplied by insured amount. The insured amount is only 10 lakh divided by actual value of property. That is 15 lakhs is the actual stock there. So the customer, although there is a damage of 8 lakh, but the customer will get only 5.33 lakhs. So this is very important. Sometimes question is given, practical question is given and you should uh, try to answer it like this. So all these things are there uh, discussed here and you can uh, read out them. Then there are types and classification of insurance. What are the types of insurance? different types life insurance life insurance is having endowment insurance money back policies term insurance annuity insurance which are having benefit under atc endowment means that a policy uh, is taken for a long period and the money will be paid at the end of the policy or the death of the uh, uh, customer whichever is earlier so that's called endowment policy money back policy is that the customer gets uh, the money uh, back after say four or at an interval of four or five years for example the policy is for 20 years and the customer will be getting uh, after four or five years a money back amount from that and at the end of the period that amount will be deducted from the overall amount that's called money back policies then term insurance term insurance is taken uh, a small amount is invested uh, and uh, then uh, for a long term uh, after long term uh, this insurance uh, 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 is given to the uh, benefit is given to the uh, family under this term insurance the customer may not get uh, the amount back uh, during his lifetime it's only after his death that the term insurance is paid to the uh, nominees or to his family members or his dependents so term insurance is a bit different from this although the premium on term insurance remains on the higher side the lower the age uh, uh, premium will be on the lower side higher the age premium will be more then annuity insurance plans means such type of insurance plan in which uh, interest is paid uh, or so annuity is paid say monthly or quarterly etc then health insurance all of no uh, all of you know that there is a health insurance policy or our bank is also taking health insurance or otherwise we can go for health insurance so be benefit under section 80d up to 50000 is the benefit under section 80d premium up to 50000 travel insurance motor insurance property insurance and stock insurance now what is the major difference between the life insurance and the general insurance please uh, i am just giving these three four points so that if any question comes you are able to reply the risk namely death is certain in life insurance the only uncertainty is as to when it will happen. Whereas in general insurance, the insured event may or may not take place. Life insurance contract is a long term contract, while general insurance contract is a one year renewal contract. 
the life insurance is not a contract of indemnity where a general insurance is a contract of indemnity where the exact value of loss is reimbursed the premium charged under a life insurance policy is based on mortality table this is important the premium charged under a life insurance policy is based on mortality table that is death rate but premium for general insurance policy is as per the calculated on the basis of past loss experience and probable risk factors this is the difference between the two there is again one thing uh, customer protection under insurance you see all of you know that there is customer protection in banking transactions similarly there is customer protection under insurance uh, and uh, this protection is available uh, uh, from ombudsman ombudsman from the country uh, up to the amount of 30 lakh the insured amount not exceeding rupees 30 lakh in accordance with the ombudsman scheme are covered but one thing should be uh, taken care before lodging a complaint with the ombudsman the complaint should have complainant should have made a representation to the concerned insurance company and the insurer either should have rejected the complaint or no reply is received by the complainant within a period of one month so this is important then and then he can move to ombudsman after a complaint is received by the insurer or the reply is not satisfactory further one thing is there one month within one month uh, she should reply company should reply second is the complainant is not made later than one year the complaint is not made later than one year after the insurer has replied so there is a lock-in period there is a limitation period that after one year the customer cannot make a complaint so one thing three things you need to remember in customer protection that is amount up to 30 lakh covered under ombudsman scheme then up to one month the company has to reply and the third point is that uh, the customer cannot complain after completion of one year so please remember these three things the next is bank assurance what is this bank assurance bank assurance is basically a concept in which banks have started insuring the customers previously banks were not and have not had not entered into the insurance sector but now banks are also selling the insurance products so it is simple selling of insurance products through banks is called bank assurance the concept has roots in france in 1980 and has spread in different parts of the world the concept originated in 2000 in india when the government issued notification under the banking regulation act allowing indian banks to do the insurance business but you see uh, the insurance business there are two types of this insurance business that uh, banks can go for one is corporate agent of insurance companies on fee basis without risk participation banks may go for insurance but without risk participation but only earning the commission and second is permitting to set up joint ventures for undertaking insurance business with the risk participation subject to safeguards one is with risk participation other is without risk participation so these two types the banks are going for and this has become a boon to insurance sector because friends as you know banks are having a number of customers and this has benefited the insurance sector in turn although banks are getting the commission but actually insurance sector has benefited from it because uh, these type of clients number of clients would not have been possible for the insurance sector to cover because we are all the almost all people are having accounts with the banks so insurance uh, sector uh, they had a boon when banks started uh, insuring the public so this is the benefit of this bank insurance for this insurance regularity and development authority again you see just like reserve bank of india or sebi which is taking care of mutual funds and other uh, uh, securities uh, similarly insurance regulatory authority is taking the uh, responsibility of uh, this insurance sector it was started in uh, 1919 uh, one thing should be noted irda is headquartered in hyderabad in telangana uh, prior to 2001 it was headquartered in new delhi now what are the functions of irda functions this is here its primary purpose is to protect the rights of the policyholders it gives the registration certificate to insurance companies 
it also engages in renewal and modification and cancellation etc it also creates regulations to protect policy holders calling for information from undertaking inspection and exercising such other powers that may be prescribed so all this is about the insurance sector now uh, i think 50% of our uh, today's topics have been completed uh, if any of the person has any query uh, very important query he can ask for otherwise uh, we can go in the end yes people yes dear colleagues are you listening to me friends please give a response थर्ड पार्ट दिल Now, what is this uh, factoring? Friends, you see, um, before going, what is written in the uh, slide, I will just make you explain what factoring means and forfeiting means. Basically, as banker, you know, when balance sheet is given by a customer, there is one. Uh, Uh, uh one account section uh, on the asset sides that is called bills receivable bills receivable how from where the bill receivable comes bills receivable comes from the fact that the customer has sold his stock and uh, sold his stock on credit and for that he has received the bills so that is an asset side of a balance sheet these bills receivables are sold to a person to an agent when they are sold to an agent those agents give money to the customer and that way his money comes into the uh, business immediately and the agent recovers the money from the buyer of the items later on by charging certain commission this is basically fact i think concept is clear so uh, likewise it is forfeiting forfeiting means the uh, forfeiting is similar like factoring but it is between the exporters and the importers this is the difference so just i will read it for you in a quick factoring is a service that is considered concerned with the financing and collection of account receivables both domestic and international trade the receivables created after sales of goods or services are sold to agency called factor this arrangement is called factoring this will be with recourse or without recourse what does this mean recourse and without recourse recourse means that if the uh, particular uh, buyer does not give the money then the seller will make good the loss uh, but if it is without recourse then the loss will be borne by the factor so it is more risky so in india without recourse is not there this will be with recourse or without recourse but in india without recourse is not permitted and recourse factoring in case of non payment of the invoices by the customer the factor will recover the amount advanced from the client that is supplier in without recourse the factor will bear the risk of bad debts this is overall factor so how it works i have given the working of it also if any of wants to understand how it works then uh, you can also go through this now advantages of factoring what are the advantages of factoring advantage of factoring is immediate cash inflow this type of finance shortens the cash collection cycle it provides swift realization of cash by selling the receivables to factor attention towards business operations and growth you see when bills receivables are taken care by the factor the businessman can uh, give more attention to the business operations and growth he has not to go for recovery of bills receivables so that his bill receivable may become doubtful just like we bankers are going for npa recovery so uh, the customer can go for more business operations and growth because he has given the responsibility to the factor evasion of bad debts there will be less bad debts because factor recovers himself and he gets uh, this customer gets the money from the factor so these are the advantages of factoring speedy arrangement of finance finances is really arranged 
no requirement of collateral and there is no collateral security required for it because uh, he has sold to the factor there is an arrangement between the factor and the uh, buyer and then uh, the uh, no collateral just banks are asking for collateral security that does not take place there is just an agreement similarly there is forfeiting services i told you it is just like factoring services but the only difference is that it is between the exporter and the importers but still i will read out it for you it is just like factoring with the main difference that this type of service is undertaken by exporters and importers the exporter identifies his importer and signs with him a contract for sale of his goods at a price negotiated between them giving the importer adequate credit period to pay for the imports the exporter will also inform the importer that the exporter will discount the sales receivable with a forfeiter and assign the receivables to the forfeiter so exporter and importer uh, they enter into a particular contract that they will they can sell the bills of the uh, uh, for example exporter has sold certain uh, goods to the importer and he waits for the money then he has not to wait for this uh, he will sell these uh, bills to the uh, forfeiting agency and forfeiting agency will give money to the exporter and the ex uh, this forfeiting agency will recover the money from the importer later on so uh, uh, it also works as i told you the same working is there if you want to go through it but just i will read it for you so that you will have a concept clear the importer needs to arrange the letter of credit one thing is important in this that uh, the importer has to arrange the letter of credit from his banker in favor of the exporter the exporter enters into a forfeiting contract with the forfeiter then the actual export takes place the bills are drawn by the exporter seller because he is selling the goods and he will draw the bill accepted by the importer buyer and will be backed by letter of credit of the importer's bank here letter of credit concept is important in case of uh, this forfeiting the forfeiter makes payment to the exporter 100% after deducting his discount and other incidental charges the forfeiter either holds the documents till full maturity or sells them to another investor on a non recourse basis the holder of the notes then presents each receivables to the bank at which they are payable as they fall due to the importer's bank and he uh, gets the money and earns the commission so uh, the uh, forfeiter earns the commission for it so this is the working of the factoring and forfeiting same procedure for both these the only difference being here it is importer and exporter but importer has to arrange for letter of credit in this case in our previous case it was not like that there is a simple agreement between the two advantages what are the advantages it provides 100% financing and without recourse here you see in for one important point please note the forfeiting uh, is without recourse always it is not with recourse although we had read in previous uh, paragraph that factoring is with and without recourse but uh, forfeiting is without recourse improves cash flow of exporter saves administrative cost of exporter for management of receivables it enables the exporter to avoid various risks like interest rate risk currency risk credit risk and political risk you see when exporter has sold the item to the for, um, this forfeiting agency then he has not to bother about the rate in, uh, of interest is taking place or currency risk is taking place or credit risk is taking place or any political change is there because he has already given a commission to the person who has uh, uh, the forfeiting agency and got the money from the uh, forfeiting agency now it is the botheration of the forfeiting agency to recover the amount from the import second is off balance sheet items friends again i am coming to the account section and because uh, many of you might have cleared the uh, gib uh, in this account section in which you have uh, assets and liabilities but some items are there which are not shown in assets or liabilities these are called off balance sheet items these are not shown in the account section of the balance sheet but these are shown as notes 
of accounts notes of accounts in the balance sheet whenever you read the balance sheet of a particular borrower or a particular customer you should read out the notes of the balance sheet also notes of accounts on which the off balance sheet items are given there what are these off balance sheet items these are the uh, the uh, guarantees taken by a particular customer or the uh, letter of credit taken by a particular customer or any deferred payment guarantee taken by a customer these are called off balance sheet items the off balance sheet items can become a part of balance sheet items only and only if they have defaulted if any bank guarantee uh, has not been honored on the due date then uh, that will be uh, de, uh, that will become the part of balance sheet similarly case with the letter of credit so these items are not shown in the accounting part of the balance sheet they neither are shown in assets nor in liabilities till happening of certain event or default these are also called contingent liabilities uh, as i already told you that this is a uh, part of balance sheet but it is not shown in the account section of balance sheet but is shown under the notes and these are also called contingent liability contingent liability means it may rise or may not that means a guarantee may be defaulted or the lc may be defaulted it may happen or may not however these contingent liabilities are to be shown and disclosed as notes to the balance sheet what are the various off balance sheet items these are guarantees letter of credit now guarantees you see guarantees are of two types one is performance guarantee another is financial guarantee and uh, third also there deferred payment guarantee now let us first uh, understand what is guarantee guarantee is basically uh, given by a particular person and there are three parties involved one is principal debtor another is creditor who has taken the loan and another is surety which is called the guarantor so principal debtor creditor and surety now what are the different types of guarantees you see under performance guarantee it is that whether a particular item or a particular uh, uh, performance uh, is being done may be done or may not be done that's called performance guarantee for example uh, there are tender money uh, uh, any of the uh, uh, contractor has uh, entered into a contract and says that he will make the bridge uh, in say uh, one year so he deposits the tender money if he does not complete completion of the bridge in one year then the uh, then his guarantee is uh, revoked that's called uh, uh, performance guarantee has not if it is done with, well in time then it's okay earnest money deposit is also taken by contractors guarantee in lieu of security deposit shipping guarantees sometimes shipping guarantee takes place supply of machinery or material on particular date uh, if the machinery comes on a particular date or a material comes on a particular date guarantee for that it is a performance guarantee if it does not come on a particular date then there is not a that is the performance guarantee fails and they have to make the uh, good the loss performance of a machinery for example uh, the seller of a machinery has guaranteed the performance of a machinery that this machinery uh, will perform uh, for 20 hours in a day or for 2000 hours in one month but if that machinery is not performing as given in their document then uh, the uh, it may be revoked the guarantee may be revoked that is liability is reduced to money terms so this is called performance guarantee the performance guarantee is in particular form about the performance of a particular machinery or a particular uh, contract happening that's called performance guarantee then there is financial guarantee financial guarantee on the other hand is other than performance guarantee financial guarantee takes place in case of where monetary obligation of customers are involved for example in case of guarantees in favor of custom authorities uh, guarantees in case of custom authorities because nothing is to be performed there 
it is just financial guarantee tax authorities if some money is to be deposited with certain tax authorities then it is a financial guarantee court cases if there are any ca cases pending in a court that's called financial guarantee because nothing is to be performed there disputed cases again it is a financial guarantee so uh, again i will uh, um, give you the uh, idea that uh, this performance is related to performing certain function by a particular uh, machinery or a particular contractor but the financial guarantee is just uh, uh, financial guarantee does not depend on any performance but it whether uh, particular uh, finance will be given or not or particular dispute will be decided or not till then the money is to be deposited that's called financial guarantee so custom authorities and if any case is pending with customer authority they will deposit the final that's called financial guarantee tax authorities uh, court cases and disputed cases then there is deferred payment guarantees deferred payment guarantee is that uh, any uh, item has been purchased uh, for say rupees 100 and 20% has been paid and 80 80 rupees is pending that 80 rupees can be bifurcated into different term loan installments and these uh, installments are paid by and by that's called deferred payment guarantee that means first the guarantee will be for uh, 80 80 rupees then it will be for 60 rupees then it will be for it will be go on reducing so these guarantees normally arise in case of purchase of machinery or such other capital equipments from suppliers in and outside india the manufacturer supplies machinery on a cash payment of 15 or 20% at gets accepted bills for balance amount by the purchaser or alternatively for the balance amount the seller of the machinery gets guarantees issued such guarantees are called deferred payment guarantees so uh, these guarantees are deferred by the word very it is clear that the payments are deferred uh, for different periods that's why it's called deferred payment guarantee next is letter of credit uh, many of you who may be dealing with foreign exchange they may have the concept of letter of credit clear but again i will try to give it uh in brief to all of you letter what is letter of credit letter of credit is a definite undertaking issued by the bank on behalf of the buyer importer one thing please note newcomers if any person of us is not having the uh idea of lc please note letter of credit is issued on the behalf of importer only please note letter of credit is issued in the on the on behalf of the buyer that's called importer to the seller exporter to pay for goods and services this is letter of credit provided that the seller presents the documents and what is what is the duty of the seller he has to present the documents which comply fully with terms and conditions as per documentary credit that's called ucpdc uniform customs and practices for documentary credit brochure 600 the documents are to be presented in as per the this uh, document brochure that is all the documents should be uh, as per the law if there is any difference uh, or if the uh, documents are not complete then it can be rejected payment can be rejected these are the letter of credit has following parties that means applicant or the buyer which is called importer of goods issuing bank or importers or buyers bank advising bank you see advising bank is basically a correspondent or a branch of the issuing bank to authenticate the lc if any of the bank authenticates the lc issued by a particular bank that's called advising bank and confirming bank is that he authenticates the L, uh, lc of a particular bank and also takes the responsibility that uh, he will uh, make the payment if required so that's called confirming bank this is a bit of difference between advising bank and confirming bank different types of letter of credit irrevocable and revocable letter of credit confirmed letter of credit revolving letter of credit standby letter of credit transferable letter of credit and back to back letter of credit red clause and green clause letter of credit now one or uh, two or four minutes we will be giving for this concept what are these types of letters of credit because sometimes question comes from this you see irrevocable and revocable letter of credit this under this uh, system those letters which are irrevocable are the best 
because if the letter of letter of credit is revocable that means any of the customer can revoke his uh, letter at any time so that will be a loss to a particular uh, exporter in india we are not allowing revocable letter of credit we only accept irrevocable letter of credit so you see if the terms and conditions cannot be amended or cancelled without the agreement of all the parties to the credit it is called irrevocable if the credit is silent it is treated as irrevocable very important if the credit is silent it is treated as irrevocable however under revocable lc such condition is not there and can be amended or cancelled at any time without the consent of the beneficiary and banks do not entertain such lc confirmed lc i told you the bank confirms the lc in the previous uh, uh, paragraph i discussed it then revolving lc what is the revolving lc revolving lc is uh, those uh, uh, importers who have to import again and again they do not make one lc they make a lc limit and each and one lc goes through those limits that's called revolving lc that means one lc may expire or uh, uh, against one lc goods have been issued then after payment the next lc can be issued in within the particular limit that's called revolving lc uh, in this you have to remember that this type of lc is used when buyer and seller deal with each other on a regular basis they save time and effort in not having to apply for new credit each time one is required rather a limit is fixed just like cc limit and is utilized as per the requirement standby lc standby lc concept is not in our country but theoretical part it is just like a bank guarantee and nothing other than that the standby lc you should remember it is like a bank guarantee transferable lc yes transferable lc uh, are those lcs in which uh, the clause is written that the lc is transferable it should be very important if uh, if the clause written is transferable then and then only the lc can be transferred to some other this type of uh, transferable lc generally take place when the seller is acting as an agent in the export order the credit must be specifically designated as transferable otherwise it may only be transferred once please note if partial shipments are allowed portions of the credit may be transferred to more than one beneficiary so if transferable lc is there then and then only the portions of credit may be transferred otherwise it's not possible and back to back letter of credit back to up letter of credit means basically and the exporter has asked you see i told you that letter of credit is issued by an importer and now the letter of credit has reached the exporter but the exporter is not having uh, so much of uh, stocks to prepare the goods so that he can export then what happens he on this letter of credit on this basis of letter of credit takes another letter of credit from another banker to obtain the goods and then supply it to the original person that's called back to back letter of credit that means one letter of credit is backing the other letter of credit this is called back to back letter of credit then there is red clause and green clause letter of credit red clause and green clause letter of credit is different because this is a very important and sometimes this question is asked for you see again i told you that uh, when a letter of credit has been uh, got issued by the importer from importers bank this letter of credit if it has been clauseded as red it means that when letter of credit will reach to the exporter this uh, the exporter's bank uh, may make advance payment to the exporter and if it is a green clause then he can make advance for uh, storage purpose if the lc provides for advance payment to the exporter you see again if the lc provides for advance payment to the exporter for the purpose of procuring procuring shipment material and arranging for its actual shipment it's called red clause lc that means exporter is not having certain uh, amount of money to export then if it is having red clause that means uh, uh, lc provides for advance payment to the exporter that means importer can make advance payment to to the exporter also or some money can be uh, got uh, by the exporter also uh, before exporting the money that's called red clause and green clause is if he wants to store it if lc provides for further advance to facilitate temporary storage of goods at the exporters and it's called green clause lc so uh, the importer makes arrangement uh, primarily uh, to for the exporter that if uh, 
uh, exporter is not able to prepare the material in time then uh, he can uh, uh, arrange importer can arrange from importer's bank the advance payment to the exporter for shipment material and for storage material if we, uh, and if for storage material then it becomes green clause otherwise it is red clause so red clause and green clause let us operate so friends this was our uh, portion now the last one last portion risk management basil accords introduction to risk management basil 1 2 and 3 accords friends what is this risk management basically any of you who are maybe working in some controlling office you may be having the concept of risk management any of the transactions that takes place it may be liability side or it may be asset side we have to manage the risk bankers have to manage the risk but particularly it happens in case of asset side loan portfolio at risk so it's called risk management in risk management basel uh, accords are there what is this basel accord basically basel is a place in switzerland basel is a place in switzerland where certain meetings take place uh, for related to the risk management it is all over the world and india is no except no exception to it uh, and this uh, basel uh, first was a uh, first meeting that's called basel 1 then certain amendments took place that's called basel 2 further certain amendments took place that's called basel 3 now since bank deal in financial products and as such are confronted with various risks of financial and non financial nature the various types of risks are what are the various types of risk credit risk interest risk foreign exchange rate risk liquidity risk equity price risk legal risk regulatory risk reputational risk operational risk etc so in view of the above the banks are required to identify major monitor and control level of various functions now here is risk management function this is theoretical part and if you want to go through these notes you can go through it risk management functions what are the functions of the risk management uh, controlling uh, offices and head offices what is the structure uh, how this uh, takes place in banks the overall risk management is assigned to an independent risk management committee you see risk management structure the uh, risk is assigned to risk management committee in banks its functions are essentially to identify monitor and measure the risk profile of the bank loan review mechanism you see uh, risk is are in main risks are in the loan so banks have to maintain the loan review mechanism lrm it is an effective tool for constantly evaluating the quality of loan book and to bring about qualitative improvements in credit administration that's called loan review mechanism now what are the objectives of loan review mechanism because there may be a question from this to identify promptly loans which develop credit weaknesses and initiate timely corrective action to evaluate port to evaluate portfolio quality and isolate potential problem areas to provide information for determining adequacy of loan loss provision to assess the adequacy of and adherence to loan policies and procedures and to monitor compliance with relevant laws and regulations and to provide top management with information on credit administration including credit sanction process risk evaluation at post sanction follow up so this is a loan review mechanism that means all the uh, branches and all the uh, controlling offices have to take care of the uh, loan accounts they are reviewed and checked so there is loan proper loan review mechanism so that there may not be bad loans the npa may be on the lower side now what are the various types of risks i told you there are credit risk market risk and operational risk the credit risk happens if there is a default by the borrower that is credit risk so definition of credit risk is credit risk is the risk of loss 
risk of loss arising due to default by the borrowers or counterparties due to deteriorating credit quality so this is credit risk for the bank that means the borrower is not pay, making the may, paying the money or the credit quality has deteriorated that means customer is not uh, depositing the proceeds in the account then there is a credit risk how credit risk can happen it is through direct lending guarantees or letter of credit treasury operations securities trading business cross border exposure restrictions this means that if any company uh, if any uh, other country restricts uh, the export and import of certain items and we have already uh, made a, an, uh, a credit to the foreign uh, person then there may be a certain risks so that's credit risk so credit risk can come through default of the borrower from any of these types second is market risk market risk arises due to adverse changes in the market variables market risk arises due to adverse changes in market variables what are these market variables these are interest rate foreign exchange rate equity price commodity price even a small change in market variables causes substantial changes in income and economic values of the banks so this is market risk third one is operational risk operational risk is basically those risk day to day transaction these are operational risks it involves breakdown in internal control and corporate governance this definition includes legal risk but excludes strategic and reputational risk the example please note this definition includes legal risk but excludes strategic and reputational risk strategical means what is the strategy of the bank so actual strategy is excluded and reputation is also excluded it is separate the examples of operational risk are employee conduct and employee error any mistake by an employee technology risks any technology risk taking place business process any loss due to business process internal and external frauds and natural disasters so friends three type of risk i discussed with you credit risk market risk and operational risk credit is credit default by the borrower market risk is due to adverse changes in the market variables and operational risk is a breakdown in internal control and corporate governance these are the three risks next important is basel 1 2 and 3 and last topic friends before going to the discussion of basel 1 2 and 3 i will give a brief of it to you and that would suffice but for the examination purpose you may require certain tables because there may be question from the tables basically i told you that basel is a place in switzerland where all these discussions take place it is all over the world uh, because the world economy used to suffer many of the loans became bad in different countries so they decided one of any of the concept how this uh, they decided how to uh, how uh, the uh, uh, credits should be taken care of so there was discussion on basel 1 2 and 3 now basel 1 basically focuses on credit risk only you see please note basel 1 focuses on credit risk only basel 2 focuses on credit risk and other risks three things are involved in it i will discuss it and basel 3 is the last uh, basel 3 is the last one in which uh, what was some amendments were done on the basel 2 so let us come to discuss these three again uh, this i discussed with you that uh, uh, the bcbs first came out in 1988 capital account for banks as i told you all under this system only the credit risk element was considered that is in basel 1 account only credit risk was that means only credit was taken into uh, credit risk was taken into consideration no market risk no operational risks were taken into consideration so uh, it was a starting point they thought that only credit risk is there but later on uh, when with experience 
uh, banks uh, came to understand that it is not only credit risk, it is also market risk, it is also operational risk and other risk which we will be discussing in the uh, forthcoming uh, uh, slides. So Basel 1, please remember one point only, Basel 1 considered only the credit risk element, one thing. And the formula for this was, uh, the capital adequacy was completed in uh, uh, was uh, capital adequacy was calculated in this uh, system as total capital funds of the bank any bank if you see the balance sheet of a bank you can see the total capital funds of the banks divided by risk weighted assets what is this risk weighted asset it is that all the loans are having different weights for example as you know if you have a um, uh, government guaranteed account that has a risk weight of zero. If you have a uh, housing loan that has a risk weight of 30% or 50%. Likewise, all the assets are given their weights and total amount is calculated. That risk weight item goes to the denominator. Capital funds is on the denominator, numerator. That is calculated and it should be at least 9%. Those banks having the 9% of this capital adequacy ratio will considered as the normal and good condition of the banks. To calculate it, I have given an example. If total eligible capital funds of the bank are say 40,000 crores and risk weighted assets are 5 lakh crores, risk weight assets means loan portfolio uh, after multiplying with the risk weights, it becomes 5 lakh crore. Then as per above formula, the CRAR capital to risk weighted uh, assets will be uh, risk weighted ratio will be uh, 40,000, this 40,000 crores multiplied by percentage 100 divided by 5 lakh is equal to 8. 100 is for percentage purpose. So uh, it came here 8% is the uh, capital adequacy ratio, uh, uh, capital adequacy ratio for a particular bank. What is required actually? 9%. That will be a good bank. So uh, any bank having less than 9% was not considered as good. Second, Basel II came into existence. Basel II basically concept came in 2006 after the framework uh, was revised in 2004. Uh, the policy uh, came to existence uh, after a brief change on the Basel I and was developed in 2006. Under Basel II, what they recommended? They recommended three pillars. You see how much no, uh, difference took place between Basel 1 and Basel 2. Basel 2 revised the framework and was based on three main pillars. What were the three main pillars? Minimum capital requirements. Uh, and in case of Basel 1, it was only minimum capital requirement and that also on only credit risk. But now it is minimum capital requirement, supervisory review and market discipline. These three pillars came in the revised policy. Please note. Now, the first pillar, minimum capital requirement. The first pillar, minimum capital requirement, in case of Basel 1 was already credit risk. But in case of uh, this Basel 2, the minimum capital requirement took place on credit risk, marketing risk, and operational risk. Three items were involved in it. The second pillar, Supervisory review process, that means supervisory review process means the bank should develop their internal uh, methodology where the supervisors, where the division heads, where the general managers, where the deputy general managers and uh, e uh, other executives should supervise the assets portfolio of the bank. That's called supervisory review process and Reserve Bank of India will also supervise the process of the banks. That's called supervisory review process. And third pillar is market discipline. That means disclosure of the bank's different details was also included in the third. That's called market discipline. So uh, Basel, II, uh, Basel II focused on minimum capital requirement on the basis of credit risk, market risk, and operational risk. Second pillar, supervisory review process. And third pillar, market discipline. I think it's clear now. Now, the first pillar, tier one and tier two capital, 
are subject to the following limits as per Basel Accord. This table you need to remember. Because the minimum capital requirement at international level was 8 at that time as per Basel 1 and Basel 2. But in our country, it was kept at 9%. Minimum tier 1. You see, when you go to details uh, in uh, each, uh, each balance sheet of the bank, there are two types of capital. One is tier 1 capital and tier 2 in banks only, not for customers balance sheet. Banks balance sheet has tier 1 capital and tier 2 capital. Tier 1 capital should be 4. What, what is tier 1 capital? That I have discussed in detail in the coming slides. And you can uh, read out that. But here, tier, tier 1 is should be 4. Of which common equity tier 1 capital. From this, the common equity tier 1 should be 2. What is this common equity tier 1? I have discussed it in the notes. Of which additional tier 1 capital at that time was 0. Maximum tier 2 capital. Within total uh, capital, again, it was to be 4. Tire 1, 4. Tire 2, 4. But within total capital. Capital conservative buffer, it was 0 at that time. Minimum common equity tire 1 capital plus CCB. That is C plus F. It was 2. And again, minimum total capital was uh, plus capital conservative buffer, it was 8. So overall, in Basel 1 and 2, the capital adequacy ratio should of the bank should be at 8% in international level. But in India, we had kept it at 9%. Now, what are these tier 1 and tier 2 capital? Friends, please go through these notes and you will come to understand what is tier 1. What are the uh, points that are included in tier 1 capital? Then what is additional tier 1? What is tier 2? You see, what is tier 2 I have given in the definitions? Second, I discussed with you the second pillar that was supervisory review. What is under supervisory review? I will give a brief of it. The supervisory review process recognizes the responsibility of the bank management in developing an internal capital assessment process and setting capital targets that are commensurate with the bank's risk profile and control environment. Thus, internal capital adequacy assessment process is an important component of supervisory review process. So in uh, addition to capital adequacy assessment, which is being done by banks, they focused on internal capital adequacy process should be done by the banks. The four key principles of supervisory review are, supervisory review focused on these four principles. The bank should have a process for assessing their overall capital adequacy. Second, supervisor should review and evaluate bank's internal capital adequacy assessment. Third, supervisor should expect banks to operate above the minimum regulatory level. And fourth, supervisor should seek to intervene at an early stage to prevent capital from falling below the minimum levels. So these are the supervisor's uh, views which have to be taken place. Then third pillar is market discipline. Market discipline is basically, I told you, disclosures. The purpose of third pillar is market discipline. It is to be complement the minimum capital requirement Pillar 1 and Supervisory Review Pillar 2. The Basel Committee aims to encourage market discipline by developing a set of disclosure requirements. You see, disclosure requirements, which will allow market participants to assess key pieces of information on the scope of capital, risk exposures, and risk assessment process. So when there are not disclosures in the uh, balance sheet, for example, disclosures means there should be disclosure how much of NPA mm, percentage of the bank is there or how much uh, how many of the accounts have been uh, this uh, 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 upgraded? Uh, how many have been uh, downgraded? All these, uh, or uh, uh, in how many accounts uh, that uh, RBI policy has been, uh, as per RBI policy, they have been uh, rescheduled or restructured? Rescheduled or restructured? These all things are to be disclosed. That is disclosure policy. So uh, I think Basel 2 is clear to all of you. Now coming to Basel 3 and last one. Now in Basel 3, what happened? Basel 3 is basically a modified role of Basel 2. It is just like Basel 2. But it started, uh, um, it took a, a Basel uh, 3 concept was that uh, it should be nearly 11%. The capital adequacy ratio should be nearly 11%. 
so uh, two percent was added in it where it has been added i will give you in the chart and uh, this framework was started in december 2010 and uh, rbi had uh, focused that uh, it should start from april 2013 in india in phases and was scheduled to be fully implemented on in march 31 2019 but as all of you uh, know that what happened in the last two years it could not be completed so it was extended to april 1 2021 and again to 1st october 2021 now it has been extended to april 2022 so this may be a question please note it that basel 3 is to be implemented with effect from april 1 2002 unless there comes any change in between your exam date and today if there is any change in ex uh, before your examination date or today, then this date will be changed. Otherwise, at present, it is April 1, 2022, as per master directions and circular by Reserve Bank of India, dated October 22, 2021. Basel 3 is an enhanced phase of Basel 2, primarily in four areas. Augmentation in level and quality of capital introduction of liquidity standards this is the new concept in this uh, basel 3 introduction of liquidity standards what is this liquidity standard i have discussed in the notes modification in provisioning norms better and more comprehensive disclosures now from the table friends you will immediately come to know the difference and that will be sufficient for your examination purpose you see you see the difference between the two just see the chart the minimum capital requirement in was at 8 in basil 1 and 2 and basil 3 it says 9 minimum tire 1 4 here maximum was 6 but here it has been increased to 7 in basil 3 of which common equity tire 1 here it was 2 only but here it has been increased to 5.5 of which total uh, of which additional tire one capital it should be here it was here zero but in basel 3 it has been increased to 1.5 1.5% 1 maximum tire two capital within total capital here it was four but here tire two has been reduced you see the difference tire two importance has been reduced it uh, what has increased is tire one has increased you, you see tire one has increased to seven and tire 2 has been reduced to 2. That means banks should have more strong tire 1 capital. Capital conservative buffer means uh, if there is any shocks or certain losses, then banks should have a capital conservative buffer. So buffer, buffer means uh, immediate uh, should have some liquidity. So that is uh, here it was 0. But in Basel 3, it was decided that banks should have more 2.5. Minimum common equity tire 1 capital. Here it was 8, but total capital plus CCB, it should be 11.5. You see, minimum total capital was a 9 here, plus CCB, capital conservative buffer. Capital conservative buffer is 2.5. So 8 plus 2.5, it is 11.5. So those banks having the capital adequacy ratio of 11.5 will be treated as better if we go as per the Basel 3 guidelines. So this is the friends uh, overall uh, difference between the two. Now one term more is their counter cyclic capital buffer. Counter cyclic buffer is that in addition to capital conservative buffer, Basel 3 introduces another capital buffer in the range of 0.25%, 0 to 2.5% of risk weighted assets, which could be imposed on banks during periods of excess credit growth. If banks are having excess credit growth, then there should be other counter cyclic capital buffer but it is not part of this uh, basel 3 accord uh, but it is a safety measure it can be invoked by reserve bank of india that is counter cyclic capital buffer if there is excess credit growth now the two norms that were introduced in basel 3 i told you is introduction of liquidity norms what are these two liquidity norms as per basel 2 two minimum standards are LCR, liquidity coverage ratio, and NSFR, net stable funding ratio. 
for funding liquidity were prescribed by Basel committee. So, so two uh, liquidity ratios were introduced in this. One is liquidity coverage ratio and another is net stable funding ratio. This LCR is for short period and NCFR is for long period. This is the only concept. For the examination purpose, I think this is uh, uh, sufficient. But if any of you wants to go into the details, then you can go for definition of LCR. I have given it what LCR actually means and how LCR is calculated. I have given the method also and formula also. You can go through it. You see, friends, I have given the formula what is cash outflow, what is cash inflow. You can go through it if you want to understand. So friends, uh, this is our topic for today, which I have discussed with you. Uh, I stop here uh, by the request that if any of uh, our colleague, any of our friend is having any query, you are most welcome. And I am here to help you. Our Varji Institute is here to help you. Please. Yes, friends. Hello, friends. Can somebody respond? He is asking.